Okay, so this is the FightFan.com podcast, um, and uh, my name is Ace, and we've got uh, John Short on the line. So uh, we were going to talk a little bit today about the news from Edmonton, and I uh, had planned to speak about it anyway, and, the, and and there was an announcement today, but we just thought we'd start out by, uh, John, if you could maybe tell your, uh, a little bit about yourself to the listeners out there who might not be familiar with you, just a little bit about your background, uh, how you got involved in the sport, and any, anything you'd like um, our listeners who might not be familiar with you to know about yourself to start. Well, it's it's a it's a long story, so I'll cut it to seven or eight months. Sure, yeah. But uh, I got into the media as a 15-year-old kid, and I'm now over 80, and I was in the media virtually full-time at least every week uh, from the age of 15 until September of this year, September, October of this year. And uh, a lot of that time was spent covering boxing when boxing was a, a kind of a legitimate sport in, in Edmonton and elsewhere. Uh, I've been... I've, covered several championships, spent a lot of my early days uh, in the media and before with a guy named George Chevallo, uh who's not in very good shape in Toronto these days as we speak. He's, uh, he, he's having all kinds of health problems, which are not unexpected considering the way he fought for a living. But uh, having said I've been around it, I boxed a little bit, I was a judge for a while, and ultimately it came back to being what I am. I'm a reporter, the, the most the important thing for me was to try and get it right. Uh, as a result of that, I covered I covered the Saturday 76 Olympics. I've covered boxing at the national and international level for I'd say I'd say 50 years. Wow, that that's I mean it's a, it, first of all it's a real pleasure to have you come and speak with us. I think that's great. Um, you were you were writing in the Sun up until last year, is that correct? The Edmonton uh, Sun until uh, yeah until uh, September October something like that, and before that the Edmonton Journal for about twenty five years. I spent twelve years uh, with the Canadian press covering both sports and politics, and then the more politics you cover in a situation like that, you realize that basically uh, sports and politics are the same game. <laughs> uh, it, it, you, you, don't have to, you don't have to like that. You just have to recognize it, that there's more sport in politics and more politics in sport than anybody can possibly appreciate from the other side. And we had the, the, the mixture of sport and politics in, this, in the really unfortunate way that Edmond City Council handled its response to, to the tragedy of Tim Haig. Well, I think that's a good segue to, uh, like, just to let the, the readers know, I've had the pleasure of speaking to you at ringside at Edmonton at the fights over the last few years, and I kind of know that the it seems like the media is moving more and more away from local writers and stuff, so when we ta- we chatted last time, I thought it was uh, really great to have the opportunity to have you come on and speak with us here about this or any other issues, but the, the Edmonton situation that you speak of, uh, that's a good segue in just starting to, uh, you know, get into the fact that uh, there was this incident in Edmonton, and I thought we would start out by there there's going to be some listeners out there across Canada who might not really be familiar with the situation so I was hoping you could just kind of give us a brief uh, summary of what the incident that we're speaking about that started this all off and and sort of how it got to where we are now to where the the ban was put in place in December if you don't mind just giving a few details. It was a heavyweight so-called main event although it was only scheduled for six rounds between Tim Haig and Adam Braidwood. Some people not familiar with boxing might remember that Adam was a a very good Edmonton Eskimos defensive lineman who got injured and was forced to give up football and went through all kinds of personal problems and and resurrected himself. And these are his words, not mine. He resurrected himself as a human being by getting into boxing and was showing some promise, still does. Uh, Not that he's ever a candidate for a major championship. Uh, It just doesn't happen when you get to the sport as late as he did. But uh, he, I would suggest, is the easily... The, the best and most powerful heavyweight in Canada. Well, Tim Haig, his opponent, was a, a former uh, kickboxer, MMA fighter, unlimited contact fighter, who loved to fight. He didn't care if he boxed or wrestled or, or, or wound up exchanging kicks for fun. He loved it. And his record basically said that, that he could fight anybody and he would fight at anybody. And he, he was uh, not scheduled to fight 
uh, Braidwood until one of the, the scheduled opponents dropped out. Short notice, the local promoters had to find somebody, and Haig said, in effect, pick me, pick me, uh, I'll, I'll give him a good fight, I can win the fight, I need the money, I want to do positive things for my son. All those positives overwhelmed the fact that he had lost some fights as a kickboxer in the Soviet Union, or what used to be the Soviet Union, and also that he was not doing very well in training. There is a story that he actually was flattened in training for the bout. We don't know that, but it, it's a very common story. And and he should not have been allowed to fight Adam Braidwood under any circumstance in the world. Uh, the fight should never have been made. Once it was made, uh, there were three knockdowns, all by Braidwood uh, on Tim Haig in the first round. And clearly, the fight should have been stopped. It was not stopped. Haig went out in the second round, got hit again, got knocked down, and nobody will ever know for sure what was the, the deciding uh, element that caused his death? Was it the fact that he'd been hit that many times and that hard? Was it the fact that his head hit the canvas so hard when he went down? The reality is that Tim uh, was helped back to his, his corner. Uh, Braidwood actually helped him back to his corner. And, and then in the dressing room, from the dressing room, we all got the word late in the evening that uh, Haig had had to go to the hospital. And we were told immediately that there was almost no possibility he would survive. And, and less than a day later, he did not survive. And that was June of, of last year. I remember it at the time. Um, and obviously, I mean, I love boxing. I'm sure just like you do, you mentioned how long you, you've been a part of it. And it's this unfortunately isn't something that's new to me, the actual act of the tragedy happening itself. And I know that in this day and age, um, in recent years, everybody has a lot more immediate of an opportunity to uh, have a voice uh, to, to point out, to try to point fingers. So I know that there was a lot of, um, you know, people looking for answers in the immediate aftermath. But uh, I just kind of wanted to get your thought. You touched on it a little bit of, uh, you know, where, where does where where was the breakdown in the system here, in, in your opinion? Where, where, well, where? Uh, first of all, uh, these things start with, with the, the organization, with Tim Hague's people. Somebody in his group of friends and supporters, and he had many of them, likable, respected guy, teacher in, in, in the real world, uh, and, and a good teacher at a school near Edmonton. Somebody had to convince him not to fight. Failing that, somebody had to go to the commission and say, no fight. Somebody had to give information to the promoters of the fight factually, if in fact this was a, 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 an element of truth, that he'd been stopped while training for the fight. None of those things happened. Ultimately, the person responsible for checking all the records, what did he do in Russia, what did he do as, in training, what did he do all these other places, all of that comes down to the Boxing Commission. The Edmonton Boxing and Unli Wrestling and Unlimited Contact Fighting Commission. I don't even know what the name is. <laughs> I've developed so little respect for the organization long before that incident that I almost consciously decided I didn't want to remember the name. <laughs> Fair enough. So in terms of that, the the problems that obviously that kind of put a, a spotlight on, on this particular issue kind of blew up in the national media and there were a lot of questions being asked. But the problems with the, the commission, as it were, it stems back before this incident, does it not? Like you, we had kind of chatted a little bit about this before. There's There, there's, there needed to be some reform here long before this incident happened. Is that is that fair to say? Well, it, it, it's very interesting that two levels of city government, two, two separate the administration of two separate mayors was responsible for this. Years ago, when Stephen Mandel was the mayor, a former alderman named Ron Hayter was running the what was then the Edmonton Boxing and Wrestling Commission. Remember, I said former alderman, respected reporter for uh, previous years. Mm -hmm. He went to Mandel and said... Things are, don't look very good. We have these negative responses to the hiring of, of Commissioner Reed. Uh, will you please 
have city council take a look at this in public. City council shut it down. They basically refused to listen to these comments from a former colleague who had done a good job running that program, and it didn't happen. They just said, no, we're not doing it. And this guy, this Reed and, and his so-called allies, were allowed to, to continue. They got rid of some very good referees. They made it very difficult for some judges to stay inside the program. Um, they, it just it changed dramatically. It, it became a search by one man for absolute control of, of boxing, wrestling, unlimited combat sport, and it didn't work worth a darn. Well, the issue was well known to the current mayor, Mayor Iveson. He knew, too, that there were complaints on a regular basis that nothing was being done adequately, that the checks and balances required by a commission were not being watched. And you know, Ace, that one of the things a commission has to do is say, uh, we can't allow mismatches. We cannot allow them. People get hurt in this sport anyway. And uh, there was a lot of blinking going on. Ultimately, we wound up in this in this situation. And, and uh, then the council, in my view, made it much worse. They, they spent a few days saying all the correct things about how tragedies like this must be averted, that uh, young fighters, older fighters, or whatever, should not be forced to go through this. Excuse me. <laughs> and then one day, with no, with no announcement, with no preparation, they declared that they were suspending boxing and all combat sports. Very soon after that, they said, well, that won't include wrestling because wrestling is not really a sport. It's, a, it's an exhibition that involves uh, sports techniques and, and physiques and all those things. But they didn't consult anybody in wiping out a boxing, a, a bunch of boxing careers. A lot of young fighters living in Edmonton were, were supplementing their income on a regular basis by fighting three or four times a year. Some of them showed some promise. I don't think there were any world champions there. But some of them showed some promise and were using the money positively. They were told one day they couldn't do this anymore. There was a major bout scheduled for Jelena Mergenovic, her 50th bout, supposed to be a world championship bout. They didn't consult with her. Yeah, I like, that was kind of my next question for you here was that um, it's sort of like uh, this the the incident sort of thrust the spotlight I mean in Canada and across the world to an extent on the situation that was happening there and it seemed that the reaction like you just mentioned was was to ultimately say well we're going to shut down and there won't be any combat sports in Edmonton in 2018 I think that was the decision they made in December so I kind of wanted to ask uh, do you think that was just their reaction? Um, was it a correct reaction on their part? And uh, what did it, that accomplish? It was, it what, was what not you... in any sense a, a correct reaction right, but, right. For, for being so quick, Ace. But uh, there is an element, there will always be an element in, in a society that says fighting is bad. Right. right. And therefore, to license fighting is bad. And if you want to go down that road then you have to respect, you have to believe somehow that young, aggressive males and females will not find a way to fight somewhere. The, the commissions, the governments, the governing bodies, they exist for safety reasons. And when mistakes are made, even when no mistakes are made, people get hurt in this sport. Some people die in this sport, but they die in many other sports. They die in snowboarding. They die in ski racing. They die in, you name it, they, they, they die playing football. I think that's they, a very they, good they, point. They yeah. die in contact sport. And, and it's, it's just, it was a terrible decision. My view it was made strictly for political reasons. The, the, gover the, the city government, the administration said, oh, well, we don't want anything to do with this. The best thing we can do is turn off the light and we'll lower the, the public concern. And after a while they said, well, you know, the public concern isn't so great anymore. Let's have an opportunity here that maybe we'll reopen it. 
There's also talk now that Maria, uh, that Jelena Marjanovic will fight at Rogers Center for her 50th bout, much you know postponed by more than a year from 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 the circumstance that, that developed last June. And it it, uh, it just all they did was say, let's get our political heads down. That's all they did. They had they they now say, well, we're, we've lifted the ban. They haven't said what they did to to improve the picture while they uh, during the ban. They haven't said what was the response or what was the the council response to those who who were involved. They punished the fighters who were not involved. They published the the, the public, the pay tax paying public, which had no responsibility in this situation. But as far as anybody knows, there's not been one word of action against the commissioner. And again, from the outside, it may be that they just said, we're not going to do this, because if we find our commissioner guilty, who knows what would happen if, if, if legal people got involved in that question. Right. Right. You know, these people have already been found guilty once, let's take them to court. Um, and that's, that's a dangerous area for you and I to go down. Yes. But, the, yeah. but that fact does exist, that uh, legal issues have been discussed. We all know that. Um, what happens from here in the legal area, I haven't got any idea. But it was not, they didn't solve any problems, the city council, by wiping out the sport without any consultation. Well, that, that probably is a great segue into the update that came out today. Again, for the, the listeners here, we, I had kind of planned what I wanted to speak with you about, and then a lot of information came out uh, today just before we did this. But if you don't mind, I'd like to read you a couple lines from the global uh, piece that came out today just to get your thoughts on it. So it said, Absolutely. It said more, the update is the moratorium is lifted. It says Edmonton City Council voted Tuesday to lift the mor- moratorium on combative sports that has been in place since December 8, 2017. Last week, uh, the Community and Public Services Committee recommended the council lift the ban at its next meeting, which I I believe was today. Um, And the quote from the mayor was the message that the council was sending, which is the uh, which is the this industry really needs to be cleaned up in some ways, seems to have gotten through to everybody. Mayor Don Iverson said on February 21st. In December, a third-party report was released. It included 18 recommendations, including that a provincial commission be formed to oversee combative sports in Alberta. And the mayor said, we have made substantial progress to implement the recommendations from the independent review after Mr. Haig's death. Um, And those included, and this is from the video piece, uh, complete record of a fighter's history, ensuring competitors are evenly matched, and more onus on promoters. So I'm, it, it, that's a little vague at this point, but that is the, the information that we have from this update now that they're lifting the moratorium. So what are your thoughts on the limited information that we do have from them uh, now that the moratorium is being lifted? Well, the first time I've ever drawn a direct co- connection between politically safe and vague. Yeah, right. <laughs> Which is exactly what they've done. They, they've said all the, they, they hit all the right notes politically, we have made several steps forward. We now believe that there should be a provincial organization. Well, Iverson and Commissioner Reed were, at, were trying to build this commission for a long time. Uh, it, can, it has been said, and this is not a, co- a complaint, this is just a, a reporter's function. It has been said that Reed spent so much time trying to build the provincial body that he neglected the, the, the civic body. I, I can't say that that's accurate. I can only say that there are many people who believe it. Is there, should there be more onus on the promoters? Absolutely. But the ultimate responsibility, in my view, comes to the board itself, the, organ, the association, uh, and Ultimately, it comes to the bosses, uh, the, the city council people, who did not respond in at least two situations that I know of, where they were asked seriously to investigate the contact and 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 and, and the behavior of of of, the, of that box 
boxing organization, so-called boxing organization. So what what are your personal thoughts on, on, an, on a provincial commission? Do you think that that's uh, uh, something that's a good I, idea? I'd I, I say there, there, uh, there is, for example, a New York State Boxing Commission. Right. There are, provi- there, through, throughout the United States, uh, the, the reality is you can have any kind of a commission, call it what you want. It be a national commission, a provincial commission, a civic commission, regional commission, I don't care. Somebody has to look after it. And, and if, if all that the, the politicians want to do is say, well, we've, we've now shared the responsibility, what I want to know is how is someone in Calgary or Fort McMurray or Lethbridge going to be able to sit on top of all of the bouts, amateur and pro, that go on all over the province? A, a, a good, we had one here. We had a respected boxing and wrestling commission, and Ron Hader used to say, this fight won't be allowed, period. It's, it's not a good bout. We have standards. We've declared the standards. The opponents don't meet the standards. The bout won't be allowed. And I know that the, the promoters, even the media, used to get really angry at him, but he'd say, those are the rules. We're living by the rules. And whatever the rules are now, I don't know. I, and I've been around the sport for 50 years, and I don't know. Yeah, I mean, at this point, like I said, when when this, I've, I've unfortunately over the years, I've I've been to a lot of fights uh, all across the world, sitting at ringside, and I've actually been ringside twice when a tragedy like this has happened. Um, not necessarily uh, resulting in immediate death, but I've seen you know some very horrific injuries as a result of this, and I find that it always just brings up more questions. And I guess in, in this case, now knowing what we know with the update today, uh, what I'd like to ask is, do you feel that when boxing does resume in the next few months here, is there any confidence on your part to say that it, things are going to be safer? Like, do you, do you think that we've made some, some headway here? Uh, the, the public is more aware of the danger. And, and and the people involved with the fighters are more aware of the danger. And I see that as a positive. Uh, I believe that knowing what they know now, a whole bunch of people very close to Tim Haig feel badly that they didn't physically prevent him from going into the ring. I think, I, I, I honestly believe even that Braidwood's people might have gone to the promoters and said don't do this we know Tim too well and and Braidwood and Haig had known each other for years and Haig's story inside boxing was known he declared that he was not unhappy to die as a fighter he said that long before this incident and he told me in a conversation weeks before that he was going back he planned to go back and and fight in that unlimited situation, MMA or UFC or whatever you call it, um, because he just loved it. Somebody had to protect him from himself. Now, whether it was his friends, whether it was just people who knew the game very well, whether it was the promoters, whether it was the boxing commission, I know where I believe the responsibility was. The promoters, yes, they... They have, and they know that there was a, 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 a an error on their part. Uh, but they also believed that Tim Haig is a nice guy who needs, who wants to do some good things for his family. So let's lean over backwards to help him. And as you know, because you've been around this sport and other tough guy sports for a long time, auto racing being one, you can't turn around and say gee, you know, we could do this guy a favor and it might kill him. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, I mentioned to you in our previous conversations that seeing that incident last year was something that I struggled with for a while because I, I really enjoy a great fight. Um, but, you know, seeing someone injured like that is, is not something that we want to see. And it, it was something I struggled with for weeks after and it got some good dialogue going. And like I mentioned, having seen it a couple times before, I realized that it, it's natural to see the outrage and people wanting to immediately point fingers. Being objective, I just found that it raises more questions. And I think in this incident, in this case, the one positive thing we can say is that those questions are leading to more discussion like this. 
and that can only be a positive thing. You kind of alluded to the fact that there's now a spotlight on the commission and that the public is definitely in Edmonton and now across Canada is, is a lot more aware and at least these issues are, are being talked about a lot more, which I, I definitely think is a very positive thing. Well, from the standpoint of City Council, they said quite clearly, oh yeah, we, we've, we've, we've received a report. Okay. They did nothing after receiving the report to distribute it other than just to say, well, it's there. If you want to to go look it up, you can look it up. But no, it more than that was required, and more than that is required. As they move forward, if, for example, there is no provincial commission by the time the Canadian Amateur Championships are here or the next scheduled Jelena Mergenovic fight is, is here, if they haven't done some things by that time and declared them, then they'll be guilty again. Fair enough. I, I, I think that's food for thought. And um, that kind of covers the range of questions that I wanted to talk to you about here. Is there anything else on the topic that we didn't touch on that you want to bring up, John? Uh, no, just this, that again, as, as people listen to you on IAs, there will be some out there saying, well, why do, why do they have this sport anyway? Well, we know why. Because people fight. It's built into our DNA from Lord knows when. And, and, and you can't say we, we shouldn't have it. And I'm, I'm talking to very intelligent people who say to me, well, let's just outlaw the sport. And all you're saying, if you outlaw the sport, if you lose control of the sport, is you're going to see more uncontrolled, irresponsible fighting in alleys and street corners and and we have to have professional boxing most important we have to have amateur boxing well controlled then we need professional boxing well controlled and we need control all the way from the top meaning the the administrator the chairman whatever to his bosses at city council or to the provincial government all the way down to the referee and the fan. I want to say one thing about the referee, too. The rule in boxing should be, in my view, three knockdowns in one round, the fight's over. That rule does not exist in Alberta, and it should. I've talked to a lot of fight people since this, and they don't like it because they think a guy who can still get up and and defend himself should be allowed to continue. I don't. I think I would always err on the side of safety, uh, and, and let's hope that we get a three knockdown rule reinstituted. The other thing that people don't understand is a referee has a job to provide a fight. I can remember, imagine the referee in this situation saying, gee, I hope he gets through this because people have paid to watch this fight. If it ends in one round, they're not going to be very happy. And his responsibility is not to the public, but if he is con- committed to the sport, Obviously, he wants people to enjoy the sport. It's too easy just to to throw blame. I think in this case, the blame has to go to the very top. And for me, the very top is Edmonton City Council. I think that's fair. And just one more thing I wanted to touch on based on what you said there, and I'm really glad that you mentioned it, is um, over the years I've done a lot of thinking as to what attracts me to the sport, why why I enjoy watching something that some people will claim is is brutal. a fascinating thing for me over the years has been the inside look and being able to speak up close to the fighters. Uh, and I'm sure that's something we could get into another time, all the fighters that you've spoken to over the years, the legendary fighters and stuff like that. And one thing that people who who talk ill of the sport and wonder why people could watch such, uh, you know, um, a savage uh, showing, uh, something they don't understand is that a lot of these fighters fighting has saved them. Uh, I mean, you talk to them and there's, I, I've actually had a fighter say to me, if I wasn't here doing this and the discipline that it provides me, I'd be fighting in the street. I'd be dead. I, I, I'd get stabbed. It, it, it's part of my DNA and doing it in this controlled, uh, diligent outlet allows me to have some discipline and, and, and outlet for this and, and compete. And as you mentioned, 
people are injured in every other sport and you kind of hit the nail on the head when you said it really comes down to the regulation. So there's a lot of questions that this brought up and I, I, I really appreciate the, the time that you've uh, taken, John, to provide us with your perspective. And uh, I think maybe we'll just leave it there and, and let people see what they think of this. And again, hopefully the, the conversation that we've brought up uh, definitely um, inspires more people to be talking about this issue because I think that's probably the most important takeaway. Thanks for this, Ace.